All right, we're back. It's another Carolina podcast, Christmas edition. Hey, we're recording this the Monday before Christmas. You may be listening to this on Christmas or Christmas Eve while you're wrapping presents. Uh, either way, this is our gift to you. Thank you all so much for listening throughout the entire year. This has been a really fun year. I feel like we've done a lot, taken this a lot of places. It's been great, and it all is only possible because of y'all's continued listenership and support. So we really appreciate that. And uh, with that, for those of you that listen and, and don't subscribe or haven't rated or reviewed, I would invite you all to do that now as your Christmas present to us. And, uh, yeah, so thank you all so much. It's been a really fun year, and we're here to finally recap the early signing period. We thought we'd be back last week to do that, but then we realized ah, that was way too much. I think we were all uh, pretty dead. Although I, I sit here on a Monday morning, like right on the precipice. It's like rainy and cold outside. I still have a lot of things to do before Christmas, so I guess there's no good time to do it. But we're doing it now. Early signing period is in the books officially. No other action on the recruiting front can happen until February, until the national signing period. And for Carolina, it was a very, very good Wednesday, that first day of the early signing period. Wes and Chris, I could now ask you, without you getting frustrated, where is Jordan Birch going to play college football? <laughs> well, we believe he's going to South Carolina. Um, obviously, a little bit interesting there that he did not sign officially, but um, yeah, you know, uh, announcing to the world, uh, and it's I say it like that. Normally, that's hyperbole, but dude, there were even your average, just like run of the mill, not even big game cock fan, just maybe small even, game cock fans. Yeah, maybe even just watches a few of the games. Game cock fans were very, very curious to find out where five star Hammond School defensive end Jordan Birch was going to go. Um, it was crazy how much buzz this decision, announcement, recruitment, et cetera, et cetera, uh, created around Columbia. And um, it, it was kind of – it was actually – I thought it was fun to, to actually be in the building when it was happening, um, to hear some different – you know, there's always a buzz prior to one of these announcements and to hear people sort of speculating um, about what was going to happen. You had the entire Hammond school, uh, you know, from like first grade to 12th grade all packed in and – uh it was cool to be there and then obviously pick the Gamecocks there on national TV on ESPN. Were you and Chris sitting together? I know y'all both went, right? We both went. We uh, we weren't sitting together. I, I was up closer getting a stream. Yeah. No, that's like, good. I, I want the different different vantage points. So what was, yeah, what was your perspective yeah, so, on the whole ordeal? Like I, uh, we put our stuff down towards the back, and um, I was making sure, trying to make sure we had a Facebook stream, mm-hmm. uh, which is, is honestly – We'll give a little behind the, you know, curtain, I guess. It's a little bit, uh, it creates a little bit of anxiety because you want to have a live stream these days. And a live stream is 100% dependent on technology that you really have no control over in that um, you're hoping that your connection holds up. You're hoping Facebook doesn't crash or something because this, this isn't some, you know, TV satellite connection like mm-hmm. WLTX might have. This is uh, face- shout out WLTX. Yeah, this is Facebook Live <laughs> um, over my phone, basically. And uh, initially was connected to Hammond Wi-Fi. I think it got overloaded with everybody being in there. I started uh, getting the thing where it says low connectivity on there, and I'm like, oh crap, we got Jordan Birch announcing. And my one job is to stream this thing, and it's not going to be streaming. And if you weren't um, streaming it, then no one would have known or been able to see it. Or well, I mean, it's one of those things you you want to have it yeah. on your brand as well because it's so so many other places, yep. uh, which including I, ESPNU. Yeah, which, it was on TV, but I, I think a lot of you know people are at work. Um, it's much more likely in 2019 for someone to pull up their phone and watch it on their phone than it ever was in the past. I think so. Uh, you know, it's something you these days for something like that you need to have. And, um, you know, switched over to my just cell, regular all cell, you know, um, connection. And it, it was fine, I think. But, uh, yeah, so I, I watched it from towards the front but to the right. That's sort of where the media had gathered to sort of be out of the way but but up close. And, um, yeah, then that was that. He, uh, he did the whole deal, said he was going to South Carolina. Place goes crazy. And uh, that was that. Except for one kid. On the ESPNU broadcast, who was sitting like visibly behind Birch, who was wearing a Clemson hoodie, and he was very disappointed. Other than that, I think everyone was pretty excited. Chris, what was your vantage? Where'd you sit? Yeah, I was in the back. 
And uh, my job was sort of just to, uh, you know, it's always a little bit of a divide and conquer. And so uh, my job was to, you know, sit back there and throw out some live updates, make sure that uh, once once the deed was done, you know, to push out content. And obviously we had a lot of stuff ready to go immediately and things like that. So just to push that out and sort of get the news out via the written word. And What's um, that? Yep. yep. No, just kidding. That's increasingly... Yeah, becoming a little bit of a of a deal, but yeah. So that that was sort of my role, um, and it, it was definitely interesting. It went by pretty quickly, and I think uh, Hammond did a good job of telling the audience what was going to happen. I mean, um, we, we Wes and I have seen some of these where we know that they're on TV, and the prospect's going to be talking, and you're like, "Who's he talking to?" You know, so he's talking to the ESPN people, and we can't hear them. Um, but it went by pretty quickly, and uh, once it was time, we saw him sort of stand up and figured that was time, and went ahead and did it and yeah it was pretty it was pretty loud in there gamecockcentral.com had it covered um yep the letter of intent issue is one that i can't say i'm surprised because that's like a common theme of my life right now is i refuse to be surprised by the way that people react to things but i didn't anticipate that it would be as big a deal as it has been people have been losing their collective minds ever since the initial shock and the initial excitement of, oh, Carolina landed Jordan Birch. That's very exciting for South Carolina. And then people just all of a sudden started panicking about the letter of intent. To me, it's a real non-issue for several reasons, not the least of which is that everything about Jordan Birch's recruitment has been, I won't say without drama, but not drama that he has stirred up. The drama has been the lack of information. It has been how carefully the family has approached his recruitment very little information, very intentional, not a lot of, oh, uh, I'm, I'm going here. Oh, actually, no, wait, no, I'm not. No, I'm going here. Not a lot of commits and decommits. No drama that has come directly from Jordan Birch. And so I don't know why people all of a sudden think that there is reason to believe that he's going to become a drama queen over the next two months, waffling on his decision, going back and saying, oh, actually, no, I, I changed my mind. Everyone's free to change their mind, but I feel like the whole point of – doing the recruitment like he did it is that he wanted to get it right he wanted to be intentional and I, I really would be shocked if he changed his mind between now and February yeah I, I agree and I, I think you know if, if you're if you're the dude in this recruiting class and um and I, I'm more talking in general but if you're if you're one of the absolute top guys you actually have the leverage um you know if if you're one of the lesser guys or even one of the middle guys, I think the leverage sort of swings back to the school. And um, obviously the schools want all of their guys to go ahead and sign, you know, if they're recruiting them hard and want them to be at their program. You want everybody to go ahead and sign. But just speaking big picture, if you're a five-star, everybody wants you. I mean, this kid was down to South Carolina, Clemson, Georgia, Alabama, LSU. If those schools want you – um, you have the leverage to gather all the information needed, all the information possible, and to, to wait if you want. So I think it's a, a situation where obviously his teammate and Alex Huntley decided to wait in February to sign. Um, there are other guys at Hammond that are going to sign in February. If, if he wants to wait and sign with his teammates just to make sure everything at South Carolina is exactly the way, you know, that it was – I guess, uh, recruited, like he was told it was in recruiting and just sort of settle in on that decision, make sure he feels completely comfortable with it, then, you know, that's his right. Uh, but, you know, I, I think everything we've heard is that he is comfortable with the decision. He's settled on South Carolina and that he's comfortable with um, the way everything played out, the way South Carolina recruited him. And, you know, he'll, he'll sign with the Gamecocks in February and, and that will be that. But but I'm with you, it was, it was weird I, I was actually at Chris's house on what was that Saturday, and it was a it was on the bottom line on ESPN um, during a bowl game. It said Jordan Birch did not sign national letter of intent, and then in smaller letters it said South Carolina feels good about um, what to say. South Carolina feels good about hanging on to him or something like that. Yeah, Parap- some, something like that. Yeah, and we were like that's that's odd. That Just that, never see that that that's on the bottom line, and it was weird that. You know, you would never be surprised to see, like, a sourced sentence like that on Gamecock Central. Like, South Carolina feels good about where they stand. But to see that on ESPN's bottom line was just, to me, a little bit, 
strange. Well, the other weird part of it is it wasn't a surprise. Nobody expected him to sign a national letter of intent. He didn't say that he was signing in the early signing period. He had always said, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding was that his plan was always to commit during the early signing period. Yeah, I think it was a question. So the first time the date came out, just to sort of go back in time a little bit, was his senior speech at Hammond. Um, he Because we had heard, you know, probably December he would do something. But, you know, a little bit of a question mark because of how quiet the whole recruitment is. Um, and during his senior speech at Hammond, he mentioned that, and I'm th- pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, wrong Wes, he said, I'm going to commit on December 19th, which was the Thursday, right? Mm-hmm. And so we went through a period of time where we were sort of planning on that, and then we learned probably in Florence on that Thursday, so we're trying to gather some information on that. Then we learned that it got moved to Wednesday because of television, ESPN wanting to broadcast it, and then we learned it got moved to Hammond, and all that you know later got confirmed. Jordan actually put out some some little notes about about what he was going to do on social media, and and sort of confirmed everything. But I learned a little bit more. I guess it was maybe that day or after the fact that, like it was always sort of a. We were sort of told like, hey, I think he might not sign right. Like, he might wait until February, but I, I wasn't totally sure, I guess put it that way. And then we learned later that, yeah, for a period of, you know, probably at least several weeks, if not months, you know, it was just sort of, yeah, I'll go ahead and commit, but I probably, you know, won't sign. And so was it a big shock? No, it wasn't a big shock. I mean, um, you know, for a lot of reasons, I'm sure South Carolina would like to have, have gotten it done because then it's just done, you know. And, and for us covering it, obviously, it's, it was a difficult one to cover. Um, and I don't anticipate any more any like drama with it right now, but it's still something that we got to keep our eye on. So Carolina wraps up the early signing period. The 2020 class comprised of what four four star guys and two five star guys. Is that right? Is that the final count? That's it right now. Yep. How did this happen? We talked about this a little bit last week in anticipation of the early signing period, and with the exception of Jordan Birch, obviously a very pleasant surprise for South Carolina. Everything else was pretty much chalk. No big surprises. Nobody in South Carolina thought they were going to get, did not commit or sign with the Gamecocks, uh, nor did they, again, flip anybody other than Jordan Birch. And that wasn't even a flip, just kind of a surprise because he hadn't said one way or the other. But how did we get here? We, we were talking before we started <laughs> recording this podcast about Southern Cal, who had a good season on the field. They were 8-4 and four, despite missing their starting quarterback for most of the season. Clay Helton was on the hot seat, and then it's like, well, you can't fire somebody after he goes 8-4. and four. Pretty good season for Southern Cal, and they at the end of the early signing period, are on pace to have their worst recruiting class probably since recruiting has been invented. They're like, what, 75th in the country yeah, they're right now? 70, I remember at one point specifically they were 73rd. I think that was sort of the sign, early signing day night. I feel like they were 73rd. So Southern Cal's 73rd after going 8-4 and four and missing their starting quarterback. South Carolina goes 4-8 and eight and has what is, according to rivals right now, the 20th ranked class, including two five-star guys, including the number five prospect in the country in Jordan Birch. Explain that to yeah, you. Yeah, it's, it's worse than I thought. Southern Cal's tied for 83rd. Uh, how, how does that with, ever With ever Hugh Freeze's happen. Liberty program. <laughs> so Southern Cal's got 11 commitments, one four-star, nine three-stars, and three two-star prospects. So Clay Helton's the worst recruiter ever. Uh, you know, how I, – I mean, I I know people like to make the comment and say, well, we, you know, people be like, well, with that talent, we could have coached that team to eight wins or, you know, some, something like that, and it's entirely not true. But I actually do feel comfortable that the three of us could probably recruit Southern Cal to a little bit. I mean, does that place not recruit itself? It, it like, does. Yeah. So, so that hey, makes... would you like to go to the University of Southern California? Yes. <laughs> Boom. We just did it. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, the, the obvious answer, I think there's a few different things. Number one, Oregon has been doing really well in California, right? Um, Chip Kelly has not gotten it going at UCLA, but, you know, with Southern Cal falling off on the field a little bit, you know, how, UCLA's recruiting has not been going well in terms of rankings either. I think that the biggest issue in California has been Oregon, you know, and, and then some other out of state programs. But, but California's a big place. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's there's, not the main plenty reason. Plenty of recruits to go around. That's like a peripheral, you know, a reason that's sort of secondary. The the main reason is that Clay Hilton's been on the hot seat and it's talked about all the time. And so that makes it a little bit more difficult. Southern Cal's not the name program in the Pac 12 now. 
you know? It's They're not one of the top two. It's Oregon. And Utah now. Yeah, and Utah's doing well. So I, I think that's a big issue. The, the biggest issue, I think, is just the Clay Helton hot seat factor, which when you translate that to South Carolina, okay, and I'm not counting a magazine or, or fans or whatever saying Will Muschamp's on the hot seat. I'm talking about the president basically saying he's on the hot seat. That takes it next level. And so for South Carolina to not only not go 8-4, and four, they went 4-8, and eight, that, pre- that presents problems, and that's nobody's fault but football program. You take that, and then you take what you cannot do in, in the administration is if you're bringing your coach back, you can't do what they did. And, and, and it had a big – it was a big problem. I mean, th- there was a lot of fallout from it, and we covered that in our reporting. Um, for them to go turn around and hang on to everybody – and then go out and, and, and get Jordan Birch, I think is really, really impressive. And that has nothing to do with anything on the field. It, it, we're talking about just recruiting here. You know, it's very impressive. And I think they did, you know, they did a good job. Most of the class was built before the season. You know, that Marshawn Lloyd was committed before the season. I think all but, you know, what, three, two or three were before the season, and they were able to hang on to those guys. So let me lay it out like this. Southern Cal is not a name brand anymore. They were, but they're not a name brand anymore. They have instability within their program, uncertainty about the future of their head coach, but they had a good year on the field. South Carolina is not a name brand program and never was. They also have instability and uncertainty in terms of the future of their staff based on, as you mentioned, not just Southern Cal fans being grumpy. It's you know what the president has actually come out and said, and Carolina had a bad season on the field. Yeah. And Carolina's... Class is sixty three spots ahead of Southern Cal. That yeah, that's like does not compute. So, so one so one thing is, I mean, you do have to take into account volume, right? Because Carolina's got twenty two commitments. You count the top twenty. Southern Cal only has eleven commitments. So, it's are they going to be able to field the team next year? <laughs> right. I mean, that's it, it is. It's difficult to get when every school that's in the rankings can count 20 prospects, but that's a problem in and of itself. If you can't get 11 guys to sign up early for Southern Cal, if you can't get more than 11, that's a problem. I mean, TCU only has 15. They're 39th. You know, that's better. Um, and they've got six four stars, eight three stars. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're doing a lot better. Um, so, but the low number is definitely a huge issue. Even Virginia, Virginia's got 14. They have one four star, twelve three stars. So there that's more of a volume thing. Like if Southern Cal had fourteen or fifteen commits, they probably be in the fifties or forties. But that I think that's an even bigger issue for folks. It's not even looking the quality of the cro- class is not great mm-hmm. when you look at the star rankings, but it's also just geez, only eleven guys. Yeah, but they I mean if they had eleven guys and they were like all four and five stars. They would be up higher. Yeah, they'd yeah. be way up there. Yeah. I mean I, I was looking at our team rankings. If you get sort of to the area where South Carolina is. Um, Nebraska at 18. Again, South Carolina's at 20. Um, yeah, I'm pretty, Nebraska's the only team ahead of South Carolina that had a losing record. So, um, you know, if you look at... So South Carolina's the best, worst program in college football right now. Other than Nebraska. Other than Nebraska. Yeah, according to these, you know. But, um, but, but yeah, I, you know, I, I think to hold it together not only speaks to the job they've done recruiting, but I think it speaks to the kids they recruited too, the type of kids that they wanted to stick it out. Um, you know, you know these guys were fielding, you know, DMs and getting mail from, from big-time programs, uh, especially, you know, your Marshawn Lloyds, your Luke Doty's of the world. Do they, and, do they really send that stuff in, in the mail? Oh, they yeah. Do. Why? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> you remember how many high schools we go in and you'd look on the coach's desk? Oh yeah, and it's all this unopened mail. They do send it, but they literally have people in the recruiting office that take the mail they're going to send. They scan it, or they just take the digital copy and they send it out that way. But they do spend oh, yeah. a lot of money on postage. Oh, the I mean, yeah, the amount of money it it probably overwhelms the postal service at some yeah. point. What like, a waste yeah. of money! What a waste of yeah. like well, trees and paper. Well, no. A big Whenever part, I get mail, it immediately goes in the recycling bin. Don't mail me anything. <laughs> a big part of that though is. Um, or at least it was um, the the time period that you can mail somebody something is far earlier yes. than when you, when you can DM or, or text them, right? Well, you can send. 
I think the rule the rule is I think going into ninth grade year you can send questionnaires, which yeah. is a way to let a guy know we're interested. Do you want to come to our school? Well, yes it's, no. it's it's just more like fill out this info, which you can do that online too. But it's a way to you can send them camp information or questionnaires, yeah. and then you get when you get later, like Wes said, you can start sending. Um, you know the the recruiting materials, quote unquote. But, but it's it's such a part of the recruiting. Um, just I mean, I mean, getting mail from a school is like that. If you go way back, you know, twenty years, getting mail from a school is like that first hint or first indication of interest from a school. So it's almost like baked into the DNA of 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 recruiting, mm. and that. You know, and and when they really want a guy, you'll see sometimes they'll post it on Twitter. It'll be like a picture of all the mail they got in one school. Like teams will load up, and they'll if they really really want a guy, they'll have every single guy on the coaching staff sign like a personalized note, and then the kid gets like twenty letters from the same school in one day, and they're like, "What the? You know, I've never got this much mail in my life." See, that would just annoy me. I'd be like, "I'm not going to your school now. Leave my mailbox alone." Yeah, but to be a seventeen-year-old kid, and I mean, I, I could see how it'd be it'd be kind of cool. Yeah, I guess that's cool. That's hilarious. I just I had no idea they still did it with mail, snail mail. Um, why are we even talking about snail mail? You just mentioned it as an aside. There was something. There was somewhere else I wanted to go with this, and I'm completely off track because I was thinking about mail time, mail time, mail time. Well, I, we were talking about. Wait, wait, uh, seriously, yeah. did y'all not watch Blue's Clues? That was no. not on my... Are you serious? Yeah, you're not that much older than not me. Not in the rotation. Chris, your kids don't watch Blue's Clues? No, they don't, actually. Nope. <laughs> nope. 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 Oh, All right. Fine. <laughs> uh, whatever. Something about recruiting. I was like, man, I did not get that reference. <laughs> yeah, I didn't either. <laughs> no, we were talking about uh, we were talking about how, you know, Carolina holding, holding the, the class, class together. together. Yeah. And then uh, somehow got you on know, the best, best topic program, of snail mail. Who, snail mail. Uh, when you talked oh. to Marshawn Lloyd, who were the schools... That were still talking. Yeah, that to him that was the funny thing. Him late. At the time, that was one of that was before the conference title games, right before, and so the top four at that time, in I'm not sure what order, was uh, LSU, Georgia, Clemson, and uh, LSU, Clemson, Georgia. Who would the other one have been? Ohio State. So three of those being LSU, Ohio State, and Georgia were still swinging for him at that time, which was pretty remarkable. I mean, three of the four. And, and early in the process, Clemson had prioritized Lloyd. I mean, they liked him a lot, mm-hmm. um, and, they, and they were going for him too. They just – eventually they got Kobe Pryor and Demarcus Bowman, two really good backs too. And so, you know, they're, it sort of – things sort of fell off. But, yeah, so, you know, just talking to Marshawn about that if, – Asking him, you know, who's still trying? He said, you know, the, these schools are still calling. I said, well, I, you know, how do you handle that? He says, I just, just ignore them. <laughs> that uh, it was similar with Luke Doty. Um, Ohio State, Florida State, Utah um, were three of the schools that I know for a fact were still coming at him while he was, you know, well recruit had been recruited or committed to South Carolina was recruiting for South Carolina for you know over a year there. But those schools, even into a senior year, were still trying to reach out and sort of take advantage of the fact that South Carolina was 4 and 8 and uh, I was told that the number of schools that had contacted him was actually much greater than that but he actually isn't even sure who all it was because he had just paid so little attention to other schools like same same deal just wasn't wasn't really answering hmm. um so you know I think a lot of it is the staff it's the relationships that were built but um some of it is the approach, you know, go, trying to go ahead and get the class committed as a whole before the season got here and, you know, doing the official visits in June. To me, it's a lot easier to hold on to a kid when he's already sort of committed and bought into your program than it is to be trying to convince him when there is, you know, stuff going on within your program, all the stuff Chris talked about. If if it's head-to-head, you against another school, as we saw with Reggie Grimes, you know, the other schools can can do some things there. You've given them ammo. But if a guy's already committed, he's hanging out with his future teammates a lot. He's in the group text with all of his future teammates. Much easier to hold on to him. So the approach of going ahead and trying to get most of the class committed before the end of the summer, I think that worked out. But then I again I go back to the type of kids. If these were if they're recruiting kids that 
were more about drama and stuff like that and building hype for themselves, maybe it's a different story, but they recruited the right kind of kids. So I think given all the context that we've talked about, all the upheaval, the lack of performance on the field, it's a great class for Carolina. It This is as good as this class could have possibly been, again, given the circumstances. And yet, when you zoom out, Carolina sort of finds itself exactly where they always are. They're always kind of between like 16 and 23. Again, according to rivals, I think they're 20. I don't know about other recruiting services because they don't matter. But right about 20. Behind Kentucky, which makes a lot of Carolina fans upset. And so, like I said, there's two ways to look at it. One, good job. You were able to maintain a solid class in spite of everything that has happened. But on the flip side, I, I feel like even if you are someone that's negative because Carolina isn't necessarily making progress, not moving up. They're not like cracking the top 15, not cracking the top 10. I still feel like this is the kind of class because you were able to land a guy in Lloyd who's five stars, a guy in Birch who's five stars that are potential difference makers in a way that South Carolina does not always have someone in in that class. Um, At least not on the surface. Obviously guys emerged. Jamie Robinson was uh, you know, a four-star guy and he's come in and, and been like a real difference maker. And he's, I think going to be a really good defensive back for years to come for South Carolina. Chris is holding his hand up. I will let him go. This is a little bit of an aside. Yeah. But like you mentioning the, and it's a good point, how South Carolina's rankings are similar to the past, right? And so some people say, well, does that mean it's going to be any better? Maybe. Because, you know, I I think obviously where you really want to be in the team rankings is like top ten or top five. Does that mean you've one. got or number one? Does number that means you've got one. multiple five stars a lot of times. And if you're signing multiple five stars, history shows you got a better chance of winning a bunch of football games. Blue chip ratio. Blue chip ratio. So, you know, just for instance, look back at South Carolina's 2014 class. Twenty one guys in that class. It was ranked number sixteen. You say, oh, let's let's go get that class. That's better. Well, the four stars in that class, Dexter Wideman. Wesley Green, Chris Lamont. Chris Lamont was a good player for South Carolina. DJ Smith probably did not live up to his four-star ranking. He started. He made some plays sometimes. But, no. Dante Sawyer was in that class. He got held over to another year because he was a junior college guy. He was a good player. Donnell Stanley was not in Joe Morrison's 84 class. He was in. He's on my all-decade team. <laughs> there you go. Because he was there the entire decade. <laughs> Terry, Terry Gozier. <laughs> no, that was a good one. Terry Gozier, Abu Lamine, Casey Crosby, Bryson Allen Williams. Those are your four stars. You know, the best player in that class is Debo Samuel, who was a three, a high three, and Taylor Saltworth, who was a high three. You know, you look through a lot of that class, there are not a lot of contributors in this class at all. Mm -hmm. There are some guys who never made it to campus. I see three right off the bat who never made it to campus. You know, and so you look at that, and I mean, that's – that's not a better class. Now, now, if this class, right. if so, more of your guys from this class make it, it's a much better class automatically. So you're anticipating my question and didn't totally cannibalize it. So thank you for that. We, I, I, we didn't have any sort of rundown for today because it's two days we before Christmas. Do. and We do sometimes. I'll text you guys a little Every rundown. now and then. Every now and then. But this is just a real fly by, the, fly by the seat of our pants episode. I feel like the variance in this class. Carolina, two years ago, was what? Like the 19th ranked class in the country. And they had Eight four-star guys. Yeah, I know. Chris didn't need to have that mic button turned on, but he always likes to turn it on, even though he doesn't need to. Um, Wes was very confused why there were four mic lights on, even though we're only using three. Um, your mic is next to Wes's left hand. This is Wes's, and this is mine. I'll learn that one day. No, that's right. You don't need to learn it. It doesn't make a difference if you turn that on or off, but um, you can turn it on if you if you just like the lights. It is red, Christmassy. Um, there is variance in this class for South Carolina. That again, two years ago, I don't know what they were. I'm sure it was 18, 19, 20, 21, or 22, because that's always where they are. But they had eight four star guys and then a bunch of three star guys that I guess theoretically were higher three star guys than some of the three stars they have this year because they have fewer four star guys, but you have the two five star guys and then a bunch of three star guys. And I feel like if you're going to be 20 every year, it's better to do it with like fewer four star guys, more high threes, and get a couple of five stars. Because the difference in Carolina being four and eight and six and six this year isn't like ten four star recruits. 
it's one or two extra playmakers on each side of the ball. And it feels like they might have gotten that or they have a better chance of having gotten that with Birch and Lloyd than if you just get a couple other like mid low four star guys. Is that crazy? I mean, uh, so I, I, let me ask this in a question instead of rambling like an asshole. Is it better to have? He always has to get the explicit writing in with one word. Yeah. The asshole is not explicit. It's a con- concerted yes, it effort. Is. It's not explicit. Yes, it is. Is it better for the 20th ranked class to have like nine four-star guys and the rest three? Or is it better for the 20th ranked class to have two five-star guys, a couple of four-star guys, and then a bunch of three-star guys? I don't know. I, I think I think it depends on how the class actually turns out, too. You know, like, yeah. we're looking at it on paper right now. Um, ideally, though, the fact you have a couple of difference makers, to me, is to me, that's what South Carolina was missing from – that regardless of their rankings or, or not, the sort of stretch where they were winning 11 games a year, they had a bunch of difference makers in those classes, whereas to me you didn't have the just top-of-the-class difference makers after that, and that's when things sort of started falling off. I mean, the fact that you have two five-stars at the top of this class, um, there's actually, as far as rivals rankings go, there's only seven programs, seven teams in the country that have multiple five stars. So, obviously, South Carolina being one of them. The others, Clemson, Georgia, Ohio State, Alabama, Oregon, LSU. Um, now, all those other schools have a ton of four stars. And, you know, some up, Clemson has six five stars. Georgia, three. Ohio State, three. Alabama, three. Um, Oregon and LSU have two five stars. So, you're, you're getting the top-line guys. I, I think, especially at South Carolina, the... We've seen the blueprint. Now, whether you can carry it out or not is another thing. The blueprint at South Carolina is to sign the elite guys that come through the state when they do come through the state. Pretty much a check mark there, I think. Zach Pickens last year, um, you sign, well, you get committed, Jordan Birch, hope to sign him in February. Luke Doty, Alex Huntley, your top line guys in the state, you have to land them. Then. You have to go out to your neighboring states and pick and choose and find, you know, a few four-star guys potentially. And then you have to out-evaluate everybody else for the remainder of your class. And that could be either finding guys in-state that are undervalued, a.k.a. Debo Samuel, who we watched um, again put on a show for the 49ers yesterday and has been outstanding throughout his college and now NFL career. And then you have to go out of state and evaluate better than everybody or develop better than everybody. So I think the question will be answered in how these three-star guys turn out. Because if the three-star guys don't turn out, then the fact that you have a couple of difference makers probably doesn't matter because your depth is probably going to be bad. But over a period of time, if you can get a couple of difference makers and evaluate really, really well with the three-star guys, then – I think absolutely you can win at South Carolina with that because cause to me that's that's sort of the way they won, um, you know, during their their three straight seasons of 11 wins. So that's a really nice answer, but we're not sitting here doing a podcast about recruiting to say, hey, we'll let you know how this class is in two years or else this but, would have been a much shorter podcast than it has already been. If you're building a class, I'm asking you just like theoretically, philosophically, if, I, if you could go to Will Muschamp today and say option A or option B, option A is – in both scenarios, you're the number 20th ranked class every year. Do you think you have a better chance of building an SEC East contender by hitting a couple of home runs with a couple five-star guys every year, fewer of the mid-tier guys, or just pack out your class with mid-tier guys? What are you choosing? The top. Yeah, I mean, I would say the top because when you go – you know, like when you go, people get, people don't realize at times, I think that there's like, well, first of all, they have to actually live up to whatever ranking they're given, whether it's great or or average or, you know, smaller, lower ranking. You know, when you talk about the difference in like a low four star and a high three star, I mean, it's not that big a difference. When you're talking about a five star, you're talking about a guy that a lot of people are looking at saying this guy may be a first round pick. That's a big difference. You know, and so, and even your high four star types. So I would say, you know, you, you under that hypothetical scenario, you would lean more towards getting some some difference maker types. Which, as Wes said, that's what Carolina's filled it out with. There's been 
you know, guys like Clowney and Lattimore on the field, but then there have been your DJ Swearingers, for example. I mean, I look at I look at Carolina's 2009 class that finished 12th in the country, and it had, I think, 14 four-stars in it, but about half of them turned out to not be four-stars, even some of the higher ones. I mean, some guys never made it to campus. You know, Leon Mackey, Ben Axon, they didn't make it to campus. Ronald Byrd, you know, um, some of the other guys didn't make as big an impact. I mean, you know, Josh Dickerson and Tony Strader were good players. They started on the 2010 team that beat Alabama and made it to SEC East where they, you know, was Tony Strader a 5'9", four-star? I don't know. Were they both ranked four-stars? Yeah, they were. They wow. were. Um, Stephon Gilmore was a 6.04 star. That's pretty good. He should have been higher, but hey. Oh, I thought he was five. Splitting hairs hmm. a little bit. Yeah. What, five yeah. is six one? What's that? Five it's is six, six one. one. Yep. Okay. yep. So he was right on that line. But then, you, you know, Dwayne Chisholm was another one. Then you had guys that did make it. To, I mean, Devontae Hallman was a 5'8". That was a hit. You know, Alshon Jeffrey should have been ranked higher. He was a mid-tier four-star. He was a 5'9", four-star. He was a 5'9", four-star. Um, Lamar Scruggs was a low four-star. You know, then you had you go to the 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 bottom half, so to speak, of class. DJ Swearinger, high three-star. Then you've got uh, Jimmy Legree, low three-star. He was a starter, mm-hmm. a pretty good player. Um, was a, Kevious Watkins was a two star, Justice Cunningham. So you trade those guys out for a couple of your four stars, even and you know, evens out. So the point is, they signed some no brainers in the class. So if you want to have some no brainers, and then hope you hit on your evaluations from there. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I would if you gave me the choice of signing. You know, hey, you can get two or three five stars a year, and then you know whatever the other rankings are, whatever. I mean, if you see them and you like them. There are guys every year that you go through. Sometimes this happened in South Carolina's class or it's other classes, and you go, man, these guys, they're ranked way too high in my opinion. You know, So I'm not crazy for thinking that even though this class is 20, that this could be a difference-making class for Carolina. Again, mostly just because of those top two guys because it gives you more of a chance than you normally have. Like the last two years, South Carolina has had one star, one five-star guy, and I think 17 four-stars in the last two classes. And now you're trading out a bunch of those four-stars for more high-end talent. And seriously, like, what was the difference in the Carolina-Tennessee game? I know they won by 20, but the difference is Tennessee had more playmakers. Like Marquez Calloway and Juwan Jennings just won that game. Carolina didn't have anybody to just take over. Well, and, and that's still, to me, I think that's still a little bit of a concern. Now, they have Mar- Marshawn Lloyd's the best back that Carolina signed in a long time, and certainly under Will Muschamp as the best back in the short and the long term. I'm still a little concerned overall if you know if I'm a Carolina fan I look at the roster and I'm still a little concerned about the the playmaking ability specifically at receiver. Right. Well yeah and yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's still a huge concern but the yeah. point is like Carolina has like now a guy that you can look at and say he is supposed to be a playmaker. He's someone that can theoretically come in and make plays. Again, maybe not right away. Obviously it's about these guys developing, panning out like a whole bunch of different things, but you have to at least give yourself a shot with some of that high end talent. And I feel like Carolina's done that now this year more than in recent classes, even if the class on paper looks the same, has a similar ranking, similar composite score, or you know, whatever. I, I just appreciate the variance of this class. Cool. Twenty uh nineteen? Nineteen guys? Early signing period? Signed? Yeah. Mm, if we if you include if you include Boogie and Birch, whom we are assuming will sign in February, that's nineteen. Yeah, that should be nineteen. And they have slots for three more guys because yes, there are three guys right. that are being counted for the twenty twenty class. Yes. So in February, Reggie Grimes is still a target. Seems like he may be Oklahoma, but you have a couple months to change his mind on that. Who else? Is Carolina with whom else is Carolina going to fill out this class? You know, I think the guy that you most can circle in and, and say probably going to be in the class is Jakari Caldwell from right. Northwestern receiver. You know, a, a kid that I, I think they're in good shape with. He had a big senior year. A bunch of schools have rolled in in the last month. Um, he's gotten like ten offers within the last month. Uh, South Carolina being one of them. Uh, you know, I think they really really like this kid. I think he really likes them. Um, took some official visits this past month. Uh, we'll take a few or take a couple actually in January one being to South Carolina. And then I would look for him to join the fold at, at some point uh, and then sign in February. So that, that would be one. Um, I think you can almost 
I won't say guarantee, but I think there's a really good chance that one of the other spots would go to a running back, uh, you know, whether that be Zaquandre White, the JUCO, or whether they can continue to push into the mix with Henry Parrish. Uh, you know, that's a kid that I, I think South Carolina is heavily involved with, uh, Florida is involved with, still a little bit I've heard, and Ole Miss uh, with Lane Kiffin is making a push for two. Um, you know, but Henry Parrish, a difference maker, probably becomes a priority target maybe for some other schools as well as they re- reevaluate their board. Um, then, you know, the, I guess the big question, Chris, is what happens with theor- that theoretical third spot? Um, do you go, you know, do you get another defensive end? Obviously, Reggie Grimes is a bit of a long shot now. They were looking at a Juco kid um, who I won't even try to pronounce his name. Um who signed with Louisville during the early signing period. They at least had looked at him. We don't really know how much of a priority he was going to be. But I think potentially another defensive end if they like somebody. Potentially you go DB um, if they find somebody they really like or, or want to circle back on somebody. Or potentially you, you know, this, I think it's important to remember they're constantly reevaluating their board. And um, you could take an NFL draft approach and just say, best available just go whoever's the best remaining player that you're highly involved with and that likes you um you know take him okay well merry christmas y'all it was a good class for carolina maybe better than that 20th ranking just like that 16th ranking wasn't quite as good it's all an inexact science some would call it an art wes and chris are good at it i mentioned this on our gamecock central 107.5 the game ultimate collab super duper project recruiting special on wednesday that was the official title uh the y'all are just too good at your jobs so signing day has been a little less exciting now fortunately for south carolina you had the exciting news of jordan birch but other than that it was pretty much all chalk so next year y'all take a couple weeks off before signing period Hmm. so that we can be a little more surprised by what happens deal deal and you had i don't know if our boss is gonna like that but i'm i'm cool with it um you know I, i think we probably do need to at least mention that Jaheim Bell committed on signing day, even though it was expected. Mm-hmm. The nice pickup. It was so expected that Chris was adding him to the class. Um, <laughs> Oops. During uh, our special before he had committed. Whoops. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think everybody expected it. And, um, you know, another just really, really good athlete. Uh, could play multiple positions. I think that's a trend with this class. You look at Eric Shaw. They, they really landed two tight ends that are incredibly athletic that are capable of playing other positions and, um, you know, that maybe can help them this coming season, which I think we all, you know, we've talked about it. It's it's a need. They're going to need playmakers on the offensive side of the ball. Eric Shaw, also a guy who could end up playing defense and be great over there, either at linebacker or more of a buck, defensive end, pass rush type guy. Um, but, yeah, Jaheim Bell was someone that they, they beat some really big schools for, you know, Oklahoma, Florida State. He was at one time committed to Florida and um, – you know, did a good job there. Bobby Bentley did a great job with him and uh, was another nice piece on signing day that got added that was sort of, well, I won't say sort of, it was absolutely overshadowed by the uh, the massive 6'5 frame of Jordan Birch. And all in all, a very good week for the University of South Carolina. And when was the last time that we've been able to say that? From, I guess, Mike Bubba's introductory press conference, which – was like sort of an official introduction of Mike Bobo to the fan base on Monday, finding out that you'll be able to booze it up at Carolina games if you want to on Tuesday. Obviously, the early signing period on Wednesday. I feel like something else happened in the second half of last week that I can't remember because it's all running together now. And then the South Carolina men's basketball team beating Virginia on Sunday. It was a very, very good week after not a lot of good for the last couple months for South Carolina. So that's fun. That's that's your Christmas present, Carolina fans. It, Merry is, Christmas. Happy holidays. Is Hanukkah. there such thing as athletic department-wide momentum? Mm. Because Definitely. I don't know, man. It just feels, it feels like the energy is a little bit different right now. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it all comes tumbling down. But it just feels like there's there's hope, you know? Yeah. It's all about the, the, the worst thing you can lose – if you're a college football fan out there, it's hope. And I feel like for a little while here, South Carolina fans had sort of lost hope. We expected the men's basketball team to be pretty good. Struggled some to start the year. They go get a big – it's always big for South Carolina to beat Clemson. 
go on the road, beat those guys, then beat a Virginia team that nobody really was picking South Carolina to beat. That, I think, uh, you, you know way more about the, the numbers and all that stuff than I do, but I would think uh, we were looking once again at South Carolina sort of digging itself an early hole, having a couple losses that they didn't want on their resume. I would think this helps their numbers a ton going into to where if they do what they need to do in SEC play, they're you know ha- are, are able to be in that conversation for the tournament as opposed to going in needing so much to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember last year they made their run in the in conference play, and it was just almost too little, too late. And I think this win will be a resume builder for this team. I don't, I don't know if you've looked at – have you looked at the numbers at all? No, I haven't looked at the updated numbers. Yeah. I'll be doing that with Colin. Colin Taylor and I, for those of you that haven't got a chance to catch it yet, we have uh, what we're just calling the as-yet-untitled Hoops find Project. you got for this. I know. We've so had a lot of good suggestions. I'm really bad with titles. I think um, Cock Blocks. Cock Blocks is great. Colin, Colin's a little a little iffy on that. I'm – I think I think I would ultimately be fine with it. I mean, y'all know I don't have any any trouble pushing the envelope. But anyway, we're going to come up with something. But y'all should still listen to it anyway because just to toot our own horn a little bit, when Colin and I did the pod, whatever it was, Thursday or Friday of last week, previewing this Virginia game, we said, okay, Carolina's probably not going to win this game, but if they do, it's going to have to be this, and it's going to have to be this, it's going to have to be this. And basically everything we said was what Carolina needed to do to win this game is kind of exactly what happened. So um, I'm just saying... Colin and I are geniuses, and we're clairvoyant. And we're actually two for two on successful reverse jinxes of South Carolina players. Uh, Colin chose to designate his reverse jinx to Jair Bolden, who had his best game of the season on Sunday. It was a big reason why South Carolina was able to beat Virginia. So he and I, unfortunately, will not be able to reconvene before Christmas to discuss that, but we'll be back later in the week to do Virginia recap and look ahead to that Stetson game, the last game of South Carolina's non-conference schedule. And if you want to catch that, be sure to uh, subscribe to the Gamecock Central Podcast Network. Also, rate and review it because, you know, we need feedback and you can leave a suggestion for the name of the title of the podcast if you want in in the review or however you want to do that. But that's going to be coming up. So, yeah, it's it's been a good week for South Carolina. And it's I think it's important, again, as negative as everything was at sort of the end of the football season, start of the basketball season, it's really nice for Carolina to have garnered some positive momentum going into the new year into the new decade i don't think anything catastrophic can happen in the next like week and a half before we get to the new year so that's good but um all around great and this is the last podcast that the three of us will do this year and i have to say as i mentioned right off the top it's been a blast i've really enjoyed doing it with y'all i feel like we're getting pretty good at this i'm afraid to go back and listen to some of the early podcasts that we did because i feel like that's just gonna make me sad because I feel like we've come a long way, but it's Don't been be fun. sad, man. It's Christmas. Yeah. No, no, I mean, not sad, but just like, wow. I, I guess not sad. More like, I feel like we're a lot better at this Dang, thing now we than we then. were. Yeah, I feel like we were probably really stiff. Um, didn't have the same kind of chemistry, the same kind of flow. Yeah. So it's been good. Thank you, guys. Have, I hope you all have a, a Merry Christmas. And same to you. See you on the other side, and we'll keep rolling. We'll reconvene. Yeah. Right here. What, what Maybe, can I tease this? On GamecockCentral.com. Yeah, sure. You yeah, I got some all-decade teams coming out. That's the word. As um, you mentioned, Donnell Stanley on the team for the whole decade, so he's the only person that qualifies. Yeah. Um, but we can maybe go a little more in-depth with that during our next Another Carolina podcast, which will be probably not next week, but the week after. Yeah. Well, I, well yeah, I guess we'll figure it out. Because next Wednesday is New Year's Eve. Um, or next Tuesday is New Year's Eve. Next Wednesday is New Year's Day. Yeah, the big thing for me, we'll tease it a little bit and let me let, maybe let people think about this. Colin sent out the parameters. How do you you only have three wide receivers? How do you cut the three? How do you cut down to three wide receivers this decade? When this decade for South Carolina includes Alshon Jeffrey, Debo Samuel, Brian Edwards, and Farrow Cooper. I I re, I refuse not to have Farrow Cooper on and all on the South Carolina. All I decade. refuse. It just it can't happen. But You're right. But I, I mean, Brian Edwards is now your all-time leading receiver, and he played in this decade. You have to have him. Debo Samuel is Debo Samuel, bonafide playmaker, and Alshon Jeffrey is Alshon Jeffrey. I mean, three of these four guys are known just by their first name in South Carolina lore. All right, which here you go. goes a long way for here you me. Go. I got the answer for you. You want me to give you the answer now? Or you want me to save it? No, you can give it to me. I know what you're going to say. What am I going to say? That you have to have an all-purpose um, spot for Debo, or you have to just make Debo the special teams yeah. guy. 
Because yeah. it, we'll also think about this. His South Carolina career, as a wide receiver, he had one really good year. Yeah. Brian Edwards, Farrah Cooper, Alshon Jeffrey, and Debo your specialist. Yeah. All three of those guys had better careers as receivers than Debo Samuel. All the De- I was surprised Debo and Farrow's reception numbers are, numbers are actually very, really? very similar. Hmm. Although the crazy thing that I guess I knew but had sort of forgotten, I mean, Far- Farrow rushed for over 500 yards really? in his career, hmm. which is, kind, you know, comparatively to the other guys. And threw at least one touchdown pass. Yep. I think he threw. I was thinking two, but I couldn't remember. A couple, maybe. All that Debo threw a touchdown pass. Yes, he did. He did. Just one, I think. Just one. Yeah. To Brian Edwards right. um, against Georgia two years ago. But Oh, wait, no. Wasn't that Brian to Debo? I think Brian threw the pass. Chris, who threw the pass? It was, it was Debo. It was, yeah, it was, it was Debo. Oh. Debo to Brian. Debo, Debo to threw Brian. to Brian, not Brian to Debo? Right. Okay, yeah. all right. Cool. Debo to Brian. All right, so um, there's one. That's, yes. that's the tiebreaker. Who had more passing touchdowns between yeah. Debo and Farrow? Uh, then the other ones are, we, we did three linebackers, which, you know, let's be honest, South Carolina hasn't, South Carolina hasn't had the elite linebacker play that they've had sort of receiver play. Sky so, Moore. Yeah, well, that that's the given. Yep. And then... Um, so, well, I'll, I'll... I guess I can give it away. No, 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 no. We'll save no, it. We'll save it. I let me, give, let me give one of them. I categorized Antonio Allen Ooh, as a yeah. linebacker I love because that. there was a spur at the time, but the list doesn't have a spur. So yeah. You, and he... he well, in that case, you have there. to do Devontae Holloman, Antonio Allen, and Sky Moore. Well, I have Devonte as a safety because he but played, he played spur after Allen left. But he played safety way more of his career than he did the spur. So, and I and I was sort of iffy on who to put it. Obviously, DJ Swearinger is one of the safeties. I was iffy on who the other safety should be. We're <laughs> I know who it's now. not going to be. <laughs> don't go there. But uh, yeah, I don't want to hurt anybody's about, feelings. I almost thought God about forbid. my buddy Isaiah Johnson, even mm-hmm. though he was here one year. Yep, he's in the NFL, he's in the NFL staying NFL? there, and you know. Anyway. Stay in there. Make it sound like the NFL is a hotel. <laughs> He's stuck in the NFL. Yeah. All right. So that's what we're going to have on the other side of the new year. But seriously, thank you all so much for listening. Don't forget, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast if you love us or care about us at all. That will be your Christmas you present us. to us. Or, well, but not if you hate us because I'm saying that would be their Christmas present to us. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, this has been a treat. Y'all have a happy new year, a uh, happy Hanukkah, a Merry Christmas. I don't actually know anyone that celebrates Kwanzaa, and that's not a dig. I just don't know anyone that observes Kwanzaa, which starts on Thursday and goes there until the new year. Listening. Yeah, so, and if you do, have a happy Kwanzaa, merry Kwanzaa, whatever the correct way to wish that. Because I don't like happy holidays because that makes nobody happy. So just be specific, but be multiple. That's my theory. Specific and multiple. Maybe that's Mike Bobo's theory of office. That sounds like a football coach I know, right? terminology there. Yeah. All right. Well, have a good new year.